The next item of business is a debate on motion 13482 in the name of Douglas Lumsden on recognising the contribution of Scotland's oil and gas industry. I would be grateful if members who wish to speak in the debate were to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Douglas Lumsden to speak to and move the motion up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. During the last uh, debate on oil and gas in this chamber, I stood here and said that the Scottish Conservatives were the only party committed to ensuring the future of the oil and gas industry in Scotland. A couple of months on, and this position has only been strengthened. During this election campaign and in the TV debate on Monday night, it was abundantly clear that Labour and the SNP will sell our industry down the river. Neither Neither will protect the jobs and investment in the North East. Neither will commit to issuing new licences. And neither will stand up for the, for the communities and the residents in the North East of Scotland. They are doubling down on their positions of destroying the energy industry for future generations, with one promising crippling taxes and refusing to issue licences, and the other failing to scrap its damaging presumption against new oil and gas, but both condemned by the industry itself for their records in this area. Is there any time, President Officer? There is a time allocated. We have no extra time. Sorry. Mr Johnson, I will continue. President officer, I want to spend some time today in considering the recent report from the Aberdeen Chamber of Commerce on energy transition. It makes some sombre reading and rightly issues challenges to all parties and governments to protect the interests of this vital industry. It states that we have 100 days to save 100,000 jobs, a stark and chilling challenge to us all. The industry is losing confidence to invest in Scotland, with optimism here falling but rising internationally. And we all know who is to blame for that. Those industries that fed into the report all said that they increasingly believe Aberdeen and the North East energy sector can play an important role in providing UK energy security and leading the UK energy transition ambitions. But they can only do this through support from this devolved SNP government. And there is a belief within the industry that the North East should be playing a leading role but there is a pessimism about the support that they will receive in order to fulfil that potential. I'm sure we'll hear from Mr Stewart later. And a huge distrust that they will be given the opportunity to expand because of a backward-thinking SNP government who want to turn off the taps of the energy sector and decimate the industry. We'll hear from you later as well. Indeed, the report shows that the Mr. political Lumsden, environment. Mr. Lumsden, chair, please. Thank you. Um, sorry, I apologise. Indeed, the report shows that the political environment is now the biggest concern for those involved in the industry. We need stability and we need support, and this devolved SNP government is not given that. In, in fact, I'm sure we'll hear from the minister later. In fact, when asked, those responding to the survey went even further. They were asked to rate the impact of the Scottish Government's energy strategy on the energy sector and investor confidence. 75% of those who responded thought that the strategy had a very negative impact on the sector. This record has got worse and worse over the last year. It is clear that the SNP has lost the confidence of the North East and the business community. Presiding officer, the report asked the industry about how they viewed the Scottish Government's Just Transition Fund. Well, it did more than that. First of all, it asked if they had even heard of it. A quarter hadn't. Not a great endorsement of the Scottish Government's record in this area. 50% said they were not aware how the fund could benefit their business, and 40% thought it wasn't important to help in Scotland achieve net zero. But when asked which party has the best policies for energy security, it was the Scottish Conservatives that scored highest of all the parties. The First Minister stood up on Monday night claiming to work closely with the oil and gas industry. What a joke. John Swinney is completely out of touch with the industry and out of touch with the people of the North East. President officer, I make no apologies for sounding angry, because I am angry. I'm angry on behalf of those hard-working individuals throughout the North East who depend on the oil and gas industry for their livelihoods. I'm angry on behalf of the companies who are being sent decrees from on high rather than being listened to. 
and I'm angry on behalf of all of those who represent those constituencies that are being ignored, sidelined and preached to by those who know nothing about the people who live and work there and know nothing about the energy industry. <laughs> President officer, 100 days to save 100,000 jobs is a stark message that we should all be taken seriously. We should all be doing more to protect our communities and we are working with our friends and colleagues to do just that while Labour and the SNP are looking for ways to destroy the industry for good. Now, we will likely hear a lot from other parties today about moving jobs from the oil and gas sector into renewables. And colleagues, we have the potential, but this is for the birds without a proper plan. And we need to protect the supply chain that will be vital for the energy transition. In the last nine years, Scotland's low carbon and renewable sector workforce has risen from 23,000 to just under 26,000, according to the Aberdeen Chamber of Commerce, far less than what Alex Salmond had promised. And if this trend continues and the SNP continue to turn their back on the oil and gas industry, it will leave tens of thousands of people out of work and tens of thousands of families right across Scotland facing economic hardship. President officer, many companies invested in opportunities like floating wind, carbon capture and hydrogen will require the cash flow from a stable and predictable oil and gas business to fund these opportunities. That is why we support the industry. Without it, our path toward net zero will be much harder. So will the Cabinet Secretary today commit to what John Swinney found so difficult on Monday night and remove this backward-facing, science-denying, industry destroying presumption against new oil and gas, a stupid policy that is harming our energy transition. <laughs> President officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call on Mary McCallan to speak to and move amendment 13482.4 up to five minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move the amendment in my name and begin this very important debate on points of indisputable fact. Firstly, that Scotland's highly skilled oil and gas workforce is hugely important to us now and will continue to be into the future. Secondly, that the North Sea is a geo geologically mature oil and gas basin. And thirdly, vitally, and Douglas Lumsden speaks of scientific facts, the scientific evidence is clear. There is an urgent need for the world to transition away from burning fossil fuels if destructive climate change is to be abated. Presiding officer, these it, absolutely not when you didn't take a single one. Yeah. Presiding officer, Through these the indisputable chair, always. apologies facts combined mean that a serious, responsible government, one that cares deeply about Scotland's offshore energy industries, as the SNP has always done, must now plan and must deliver a managed and fair progression to a dynamic and internationally competitive system of energy of the future, something that we are so well placed to deliver. Presiding officer, this means a just transition, and there's much talk of this across the political spectrum. The difference is the SNP isn't just talking about just transition, we are working to deliver it. And I want to come back to that in a moment. But first, I'd like to address two other matters, which, uh, again, there has been much discussion on recently. The first is licensing. Now, regrettably, Licensing and therefore control of Scotland's oil and gas resource remains the domain of Westminster. Although my party are working to change this, while it remains the case, Scotland has the power, sorry, Scotland has the energy but lacks the power. And we've seen in today's prices how £400 billion worth of our oil and gas revenues have flowed from the North Sea to the UK Treasury coffers. Yeah. So licensing decisions do not rest with the Scottish Government, but we are clear that the United Kingdom Government must approach licensing on a rigorously evidence-based, case-by-case basis, with robust climate compatibility and energy security being key considerations. I will. Sarah Boyack. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking intervention. Last year she said she was consulting on a more climate compatibility robust checkpoint, including for oil and gas fuels already licensed but not developed, and on a presumption of no new exploration in the North Sea. But given the recent statements on climate compatibility and Kate Forbes' statement today that we've been clear that we are not against new licences, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm her position and tell us what our, our amendment today actually means? 
Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I'm very happy to, because I think Labour's position, whether they've intended this or not, is an outright ban. The one that the SNP has always articulated, and I am reasserting today, is evidence-based. It's case by case. It's an assessment on a case by case basis on account of climate compatibility and energy security. I'm afraid I don't have time. But this position puts us squarely between both London parties. The Tories, on the one hand, who are willfully ignoring the climate emergency, not a single mention of it in their motion today, and Labour, on the other, who, true to form, I have to say, are willfully ignoring the needs of Scotland's communities. Yeah. Now, the second issue that I wanted to touch on is so-called uh, windfall taxes. Again, presiding officer, allow me to be clear, the SNP supports taxes where windfall profits arise anywhere across the United Kingdom economy. And indeed, whilst households are still struggling with energy bills, we support an energy profits levy up to its previously announced end date. However, what we object to is, again, the London parties extending and or increasing this levy, focusing disproportionately, I won't, I don't have time, I'm afraid, on Scotland's energy wealth and putting investment in renewables transition at risk. We object, in the case of the Tories, to them using this to fund their unfunded tax cuts elsewhere, and in the case of Labour, to their apparent plans to invest it in nuclear in England. Both parties are undermining confidence in Scotland's transition, which is vital for our economy and our contribution to ending climate change. Now, presiding officer, I said I wanted to, to come back to just some of how the SNP are already working to build a transition in Scotland. Some good news. Well, that includes our investment of £24.5 million to leverage Sumitomo's groundbreaking £350 million supply chain investment in the port of Nig. It includes a £50 million investment by the Scottish National Investment Bank, supporting one of the largest regeneration projects in the Highlands for decades at Ardisir, with the potential for around 3,000 jobs and reskilling opportunities. And it includes the £3.7 million that we've invested in the development of a practical offshore energy skills passport. And on that, I'm very pleased to note the industry update of progress on this last month. I must ask you to conclude at this I, point, I Cabinet Secretary. I will conclude, presiding officer, by saying that we know the task is difficult, but the opportunity and the prize is enormous, and we are already working to build it. We could do more with the powers in this Parliament, and if the London parties would only put Scotland first, as the SNP always will. I now call on Sarah Boyack to speak to and move Amendment 13482.1 up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move the amendment in my name. This debate should be about how we ensure we've got the energy to power our homes and industry. How do we deliver the climate leadership? How we secure the economic benefits of the green economy? And how we ensure that a just transition is a reality for all workers? And under the SNP and Tory governments, that hasn't been the case. There's much talk of a just transition, but little delivery. Last month, another failed SNP deadline with no draft, no, not just now, thank you, with no draft just transition plan for Grangemouth being published, despite a commitment to publish by May 2024. Delighted to take your intervention. Julian Martin. Uh, well, no, there's a general election on, and the advice has been given that there's no new announcements to be made during yeah. that period. But what I was also going to mention, that's in relation to the Grangemouth Just Transition Plan, which we are ready to publish once the general election is over. Does £500 million Just Transition Fund not count as assistance? Does £500 million Strategic Investment not uh, count as assistance to, to the, the Just Transition for Energy? Well, the point is that those projects should have been published earlier, before we even had the election. And the Just Transition Fund slashed by 75%, the Green Jobs Fund cut, the Green Growth Accelerator, non-existent, sectoral Just Transition Plans, not delivered, the Green Skills Passport, overdue and still not delivered, and the STUC summed up the position very well. The Scottish Government has failed to deliver the funded transition support, training support, and jobs and skills audits for oil and gas workers. And the actions, no thank you, the actions of the UK Tory government are just as bad. 14 years of not investing in renewables jobs right across the UK. We need that for a sustainable future. From David Cameron proudly announcing he was cutting the green crap to the petroleum licensing bill, which the UK government confirmed wouldn't take a penny off energy bills and sends the wrong message to investors on the UK's commitment to the green 
green economy. Now, I have to say, we need change. We are not going to be revoking existing licences. We are going to work with oil and gas companies to ensure a sustainable, phased transition to clean energy. And I'm clear that the oil and gas sector in Scotland will be with us for decades to come. It's an established industry and it's the duty of us as politicians and for governments to work with the sector, with workers and our trade unions, to ensure that we have a fair and a managed transition over the next few decades. Our Green Prosperity Plan would create 69,000 jobs from direct jobs in clean power, manufacturing and investing in the plumbers and builders we need in our communities now to retrofit homes. Our local power plan would ensure that we can maximise the benefits of community-owned energy projects across Scotland, supplementing the technology we've already got, decarbonising our buildings and bringing down people's bills. We'd establish GB Energy, an energy generating company headquartered here in Scotland, which would be able, no thank you, to de-risk private investment in new technologies such as tidal and offshore floating wind, while accelerating deployment of existing technologies. It would be critical to ensure that Scotland and the UK powers ahead in the global race for renewables and the green economy, because we've got to accelerate the pace of change to create the new jobs and investment opportunities. And through a National Wealth Fund, we'd provide the funding to invest in the key sectors and the infrastructure we urgently need for the green economy, from ports, industrial hubs, green hydrogen. Scottish businesses would have a partner in a possible future UK Labour government. So, we need change. We would work to reduce energy bills, create good jobs, deliver energy security and provide climate leadership. These are our Scottish Labour priorities, and I hope the Cabinet Secretary will live up to the words in her amendment, work with, not against a future Labour government, because no community must be left behind. And it's critical that where we can work together in cooperative partnership with businesses, that we do that and deliver the jobs that are urgently needed now. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Patrick Harvey to speak to and move Amendment 13482.2. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We're at a critical point in the transition, halfway to net zero, but largely as a result of the easy wins, especially decarbonisation of electricity. Now, anyone with any credibility at all accepts the reality that change is needed. Outright climate denial is largely a fringe notion confined to the absurdities of GB News and the far-right press. That wasn't always the case. We know that the fossil fuel industry understood the fundamentals of the harm they were doing to the world as long ago as the 1960s. Initially, they covered it up. Then, as the science came to be understood more widely, they pumped out lies and conspiracy theories as rapidly as they continued pumping out oil and gas. They succeeded in delaying climate action for decades. And as millionaires became billionaires, the damage that they were quite deliberately doing to our global life support system continued. The fossil fuel industry's creation of the climate denial conspiracy movement should go down in history as one of the greatest crimes against humanity ever perpetrated. The damage it did is still with us. But more recently, the fossil fuel industry has been successful at creating a new threat, moving their strategy from climate denial to climate delay. There should be a transition, they say, of course, but let us manage it in our own time, at a slower pace. Well, there was a time when all of this could have been done more slowly. It would have been easier. It probably would have been cheaper in the long run, too. That time was when the science first became clear, when we still had decades in which to act, but when the fossil fuel industry was doing everything possible to put its own profits ahead of the survival of our world. Now, whatever else we disagree about across the political spectrum, we should agree on the interests of the workforce whose livelihoods are at stake. And to anyone working in the sector, I say this. If your family or community is dependent on that industry, if you work in that industry yourself, you need an active transition to make sure there's a decent, secure future after the fossil fuel age. And if that's what you need, it should be clear to you that the fossil fuel industry itself is your greatest enemy. It will always put its short-term profits ahead of your long-term future. It did it before, it's doing it now, and it will continue to do that for as long as governments allow it. 
So to those who say, let's work with the fossil fuel industry on the transition, it really is time to get real. As research from Oil Change International just a couple of months ago showed, of the large oil companies, including many of those working in the Scottish North Sea, many have plans to increase their global oil and gas production, not to transition away from it, but to increase it. And many of those uh, are rank among the world's most climate-wrecking investor-owned companies based on their historical pollution as well. The industry itself cannot be trusted to lead this change. Only assertive interventionist approach from government will get results on this rapid pace that's now required after decades of industry delays. We've seen, of course, the Tories ripping up their climate policies. Thankfully, they'll be out of government very soon. The SNP are now back to their old ways. Instead of accelerating action on climate, Kate Forbes today is quoted as saying, we've been clear, we're not against new oil and gas licences, and we've never said no. This represents a shameless retreat from a position of climate leadership. And they're even attacking Labour's half-hearted and insipid measures as too extreme. Labour, for their part, want to talk to us about GB Energy, but seem themselves to be as unclear as the industry is about what it actually is. It's clear that only the Greens are willing to act like our future depends on it. Shifting away from fossil fuel on the speed that's re required and willing to use progressive taxation so that the wealth being hoarded by the super-rich can be used to invest on the scale and at the pace that the transition demands. I you move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Mr Harvey. Um, I now call Liam MacArthur to speak to and move amendment 13482.3, up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Back in March, uh, Mr Lumsden and his colleagues were made to look uh, faintly ridiculous as they sought to attack a windfall tax on oil and gas giants uh, that their own Chancellor and Prime Minister were happily extending that very same morning, given the erratic behaviour of Rishi Sunak since calling an election he hadn't even discussed with his Cabinet. Mr Lumsden must have lodged his motion for this debate with no little uh, trepidation. However, in time-honoured fashion, let me thank him for providing this latest opportunity to debate the oil and gas sector, our future energy needs, and how Scotland and the wider UK make the just transition to a decarbonised energy system. Uh, the motion in each of the amendments fairly acknowledged the vital role uh, oil and gas plays in Scotland's energy mix, as well as the jobs and economic activity it supports. It's a role the sector will continue to play going forward. That said, and what Mr Lumsden's motion and his speech failed to acknowledge is that our reliance on oil and gas needs to come down, not just for environmental reasons, but for the sake of our economy as well. The OBR last year concluded that the UK is quote, one of the most gas-dependent countries in Europe, with 78% of our energy needs met through fossil fuels. Uh, Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine has uh, made clear this continued dependence on fossil fuels has left the UK more exposed to fuel price shocks, causing hardship to households and to businesses. But if Mr Lumsden is still not persuaded, perhaps he'd heed the advice of the UK Parliament's Environmental Audit Committee, chaired by his colleague Philip Dunn, which recently concluded accelerating the transition away from fossil fuels will enhance the UK's energy security. It will also help to protect households from volatile fossil fuel prices permanently. A compelling win-win. The transition we need to see will undoubtedly come at a significant financial cost, and we do need to look at how best we meet those costs and are more creative and the financial incentives on, on offer. But talking only about the costs of action ignores the fact that the costs of inaction or inadequate action are far greater still. So the Conservatives might believe no, um, that their Canute-like approach to this issue is good politics in the midst of an election, but they are kidding themselves and, more importantly, misleading the public, which appears to be uh, the campaign strategy of the day today. The UK CCC former Chief Executive Chris Stark warned all party leaders earlier this year the North Sea Basin is winding down whatever we do. So the priority needs to be removing the reliance on fossil fuels from the economy. This is not a question of policy or even politics. This is a matter of geological fact. Chris Stark also pointed out that for all the sound and fury, at the extremes the Greens and Conservatives are actually arguing about whether North Sea production declines by 95% or 97% by 2050. Whatever way you cut it, if we're still stuck on fossil fuels in 2050, then we will be importing them. Um, now, 
That transition, of course, um, is inevitable, but, but how it happens is certainly not, and it needs to have the people and communities most directly affected at the heart of the decision-making uh, process, and it will be different in different parts of the country. But however it happens, it will require both Scotland's governments to cooperate and collaborate, a consistent message from the UKCCC over the years, and a key element of my amendment this afternoon. Patrick Harvey is right, this will not be easy, all of the easy stuff has already been done, but it will be made harder, costlier and more pain painful if we pretend, as Douglas Lumsden appears to be, uh, if it, it, in pretending it does not need to happen or somehow can be delayed. And on that basis, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you. And we move to open debate speeches and I call Tess White to be followed by Audrey Nicholl. Thousands of livelihoods across the North East rely on the oil and gas industry, not to mention the wider supply chain across Scotland. This is an industry which supports the Scottish economy to the tune of almost £19 billion. It supports upwards of 94,000 jobs, and that's massive by any standard. You would be forgiven for expecting politicians on the SNP and Labour benches to want to safeguard such an important sector. And yet, the SNP, Labour and Lib Dems and the Greens want to turn the taps off in the North Sea and turn their backs on oil and gas. Hard-working and highly skilled North Sea workers would pay the price of political virtue signalling signaling that has called for the fastest possible transition to net zero. And Patrick Harvey has demonstrated today lives in a bubble. I would invite him to come up to the North East and say what he said to, today to the hard-working families who would lo be losing their livelihoods and their jobs. He and the SNP would create a cliff edge in the energy transition and devastate communities across my region. Presiding officer, the North East economy is well and truly on the line, which is why we need a sensible and pragmatic approach to energy transition. But the SNP still haven't published a proper energy strategy. They don't have a plan. Yet they found the time to release independence paper after independence paper. During this week, in the ST, I, sorry, Gillian Marty, I just presiding. I just don't have time. Uh, I would normally. During this week's STV debate, John Swinney and Anna Sawa both tried to swerve questions about the North Sea, but it was as clear as can be. The SNP and Labour still don't support new oil and gas licences. They don't support North Sea exploration, and this has a direct impact on the energy sector in Scotland and the investment in that sector. The Energy Transition Survey published just last week by the Aberdeen and Gram Grampian Chamber of Commerce has laid out the starkest of terms what this will look like. It reports that confidence amongst companies working in the UK continental shelf is now lower than the financial crash and the pandemic when oil prices were as low as $16 a barrel. A presumption against new licences would also force us to import more oil and gas from overseas at a higher cost and a greater carbon footprint, eroding our energy security at the same time. So however you look at it, the approach taken by the SNP and Labour just doesn't make sense. It's economically and environmentally illiterate. And it's a double blow for the North East because it is these communities which are bearing the brunt of new transmission infrastructure, puncturing our countryside and decimating our prime productive arable land. Presiding officer, the Scottish Conservatives will keep standing up for our oil and gas industry. This week, Douglas Ross was un unwavering once again in that support, while Anna Sawa and John Swinney were all at sea. We're the only party to support new oil and gas licences, while at the same time supporting the growth of highly skilled, highly paid roles in renewables. We will not allow the industry to be shut down, and we will not abandon North Sea workers whose livelihoods depend on it. Yeah. Thank you.
I call Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Siding officer, Scotland has indeed punched above its weight when it comes to the energy sector, with the oil and gas industry under, underpinning a vital part of the Scottish economy over many decades, a highly skilled and internationally recognised workforce, an extensive supply chain, research and innovation, and of course keeping us warm, our lights on, and providing a secure domestic energy supply. And the North East has been a major part of the oil and gas family since 1975, when the BP's 40 field pipeline was switched on and the oil flowed on shore to Aberdeen, then on to Grangemouth. And those were the days. But to date, our oil and gas sector has contributed an eye-watering £350 billion in tax revenue to the UK Treasury. And according to Offshore Energies UK, 2023 to 2022 to 23 saw the sector generate. £18.9 billion in GVA for the Scottish economy, supporting around 90,000 skilled jobs. But demand for fossil fuels will decline, but the sector will continue to play a vital role towards net zero carbon emissions by 2050, supporting the expansion of renewables and wider low carbon technologies. So I, I won't thank you. I refer to Pro Professor Paul Delu uh, at the Robert Gordon University, who recently said, and I quote, given the magnitude of change needed over the coming years, the UK and devolved administrations must pursue credible energy pathways, which deliver a just and fair transition for the sector and its workforce. So, given these comments from a well-known expert, uh, and given that we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to take the best learning from our world-class oil and gas sector and mirror that experience for new and green energy, it's bizarre but not unexpected that, given the Conservative stance in energy, their motion excludes any reference whatsoever to just transition, renewables, emissions and climate. So in the short time I've left today, uh, Presiding Officer, I want to draw on the excellent detail outlined in the latest Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce Energy Transition Survey and highlight a couple of the many points made. And the report does challenge all governments. So firstly, on policy recommendations, the report highlights the challenges being faced by Scottish Government planners struggling to keep up with the pace that industry demands for green energy consents, particularly in offshore wind. And this is an issue that I and other mem members raise on a regular basis. And I appreciate that this more is more an operational matter, but I would be grateful if there is an update provided at the end of the debate on this important issue. Secondly, the report states, and I quote, it's clear from our survey that companies will exit the UK continental shelf under the tax regime being proposed by the Labour Party. This is supported by independent analysis, which concludes that 100,000 jobs currently supported by the UK oil and gas sector will be lost by 2029. An investment of up to 20, 30 billion pounds is at risk. And for many of the basin's key pieces of infrastructure, we are rapidly approaching the point of no return. And finally, on the energy profits levy, the report states, and I quote, we have a UK government taxing the oil and gas sector to death with its energy profits levy triggering a state of inertia among global investors. Many will turn their investment plans and focus elsewhere. This outcome would be catastrophic for jobs, tax revenues and energy security. And I think the Cabinet Secretary set out very helpfully the concerns arising from the EPL. Thank you, Ms Nicholl. I must ask you to conclude at that point. Presiding um, Officer, there is a lot to be positive yeah, about. I, 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 yes, thank you very much, Ms Nicholl. Um, I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Stephen Kerr. What? I, I, I presume that applause is for the beginning of my contribution. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me try to do the impossible. Despite the heat and the noise and the ill temper, I think there are things that we agree on. The, the, first of all, is the extraordinary contribution that the North Sea has made uh, to the economy of this country, with including uh, th tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of well-paid jobs. 
The fact that we present an extraordinary opportunity in renewables because of the expertise and assets, but that will require a transition plan with an extraordinary level of an investment in order to deliver it. Now, I fear, though, that contrived disagreements and bluster actually uh, creates an environment which puts off that investment, creates confusion and instability that actually drives people away from investing in the North Sea at actually a time that we can ill afford it. But let's make no mistake, uh, if I can make a little progress, the cost of energy is absolutely critical. In the last couple of years, if we needed a lesson in that, we have seen utility bills double. Food bills increase by a third. The cost of doing, businesses, uh, doing business skyrocket, all because of an energy shock. And in line with that, what we saw was utility companies, in particular uh, the, those in the petrochemical industry, saw their uh, revenues increase threefold, uh, and, and with profits uh, by just Shell and BP alone doubling in 22. Now, the, the, the choice is this. When those profits occur, do we want to see those profits invested in share buybacks or do we want to see them taxed because they're extraordinary profits and invested in the transition? That is the proposition that Labour said. Now, by all means, question the detail of that. If I could just make a little bit, I'm keen to take some intervention, but I'd like to, to make some, some uh, uh, progress. But that is the proposition. That is the plan. And at least we have a plan there uh, to, to, to look at and criticise. And by all means, let's look at the detail. But I think we need that plan. Uh, uh, yes. Daniel Johnson. Doesn't Dan Daniel Johnson realise that the industry itself, the, inter the investors he's describing, are being put off by his party's future plans for the sector? That's what's driving investment away. Daniel Johnson. So let, let's just look at that. So the energy, because I think both the parties of government are misrepresenting their positions, or at least being confusing, because the energy profits levy which I presume is at the heart of that attack, is one that his party is committed to to 2029. In fact, we've actually, and I have the extraordinary position, where the SNP have just announced today in the chamber that they want to withdraw it one year early. So, in fact, being less uh, 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 clear on that tax, or less committed to that tax, than the Conservative government. Well, if she could clarify if that is what she meant by that comment about the original date. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, that was a reassertion of our position, as it always has been, that we supported the energy profits levy to its original date. But I just wonder whether, as I said, the SNP support windfall taxes where windfall profits apply across our economy. So I wonder, does he extend his support for windfall taxes to online retail giants and uh, to supermarkets, or is Labour just content to use Scotland's natural resources as their cash cow? Yeah. In conclusion, Mr Johnson. I think we've just heard the rather extraordinary revelation that when it comes to windfall taxes, the SNP want to do less than the Conservative government. And the reality is this shouldn't be a surprise because we've seen at least three different positions on a windfall tax from the SNP in the last year alone. And on licensing alone, Mary McCallum said in November 22 at a Friends of the Earth meeting that the Scottish uh, government does not agree with new licences. And yet we hear today and an entirely different position and pretending as though the, the previous position did not exist at all. The reality is we have a very confused position from both the Conservatives and the SNP. I'm sorry I have to draw my con comments to conclusion there, but ultimately, as Liam MacArthur said, transition is a necessity, you must conclude, Mr Johnson. Thank you. And I call Stephen Kerr to be followed by Ben McPherson. Well, we all saw uh, John Swinney and Anna Sarwar uh, struggling to answer the very pointed questions put to them on Monday night by Douglas Ross, because their position on these issues relating to the future of the oil and gas sector, to be frank, are extremely dangerous for the future of the sector. Now, one of the criticisms that's most often levelled in this parliament, of this parliament, is that there are not enough people in here who have had experience of the world of business. Now, Daniel, now Daniel Johnson has, and I think that's why if his speech had gone on much longer, he would have struggled to defend the policy of his party, because listening to this debate, it's hard to argue with the criticisms that people level on the lack of business experience people in this chamber. Because what we've heard this afternoon is theory 
devoid of any real-world context, being bandied about by members who are in a complete state of denial about the reality of what is happening in the North Sea Basin. So let's take the Greens very briefly. They would just shut everything down. They've got no interest in the tens of thousands of people who work in the sector. Tess White is absolutely right. Patrick Harvey's comments were an insult to tens of thousands of families in the northeast of Scotland. Let's take the SNP. Their party campaigned for years on a slogan that Scotland's oil. Most you know, they expressed this repeatedly, but now a presumption against new oil and gas. Because that's what we've heard from that front bench for the last three years I've sat in this parliament. And there's no point denying it. And there's no point Kate Forbes trying to revise what's been said in this chamber by First Ministers and others who have sat on that front bench. And they have argued in favour of swinging surtaxes on North Sea operations. They can't now say they're not in favour of it. Because frankly, in all honesty, we do not have straw for brains. We can remember what was said just last week or the month before or the year before. Now, don't insult the intelligence of the people of Scotland by portraying the SNP as the defenders of North Sea oil and gas. And then, and then let's take Labour. Let's take Labour. Now, you can never be sure, as we saw last night, you can never be sure of what any Labour policy is on anything. But industry bodies and trade unions are united in condemning Labour's current policy towards North Sea oil and gas. They warn that the consequences of additional windfall taxes and a presumption, no a banning, of new oil and gas will cost millions and millions and precipitate the demise of the whole sector. And Labour say, oh, we don't want a cliff edge. We don't want a cliff edge. And then they expose their ignorance of how global capital flow works. I give way to Daniel Johnson. Daniel Johnson. W would he accept that the, the North Sea Basin is declining in terms of its output by 15% a year? And that, that is irreversible. And what's more, that essentially we're arguing about a difference in headline rate? Stephen Kerr. If you, if you threaten the flow of capital into what's already there by your policy, it won't be there at all very quickly. It will drop off a cliff. There is a constant need for new capital investment in the North Sea. And if there's no future for North Sea oil and gas, why on earth would anyone invest in the sector now? And then with Labour, there's the mystery of GB Energy. What on earth is GB Energy? Every time a Labour politician stands up to talk about North uh, GB Energy, they talk about something completely different. Apparently, it's an energy company that generates but doesn't generate energy. I have no idea what, your, what the Labour Party's policy is on this. And I go back to my original point. This can only be a policy worked up by careerist politicians and policy wonks who have no idea how the real world works. Only the Scottish Conservatives will stand up for the oil and gas sector and the tens of thousands of people whose livelihoods depend on it. Thank you. And I call Ben McPherson, final speaker in the open debate. Thank you, President Officer. And I am glad that we're speaking about this important issue in our national parliament. I think it's interesting that the motion that's been brought uh, covers the fact that uh, decisions on energy and offshore oil and gas licensing are reserved. And I'll uh, look forward to the Conservatives being as open minded about discussing reserved issues in future. Um, first of all, as a, a, both a, an MSP and also somebody who worked for one of Scotland's leading commercial law firms, I hope that's enough professional experience, as well as a renewable energy company that had a wonderful and r remarkable staff team, many of whom had come from the oil, of, oil and gas sector, uh, uh, forward uh, thinkers in terms of the, the just transition. That, um, gives me a, a relevance in this debate because as well as the fact that of course the oil and gas industry is particularly pertinent in the northeast of Scotland uh, and Shetland and, 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 and other parts uh, north of here in Edinburgh as well as this, the, this, the fact that the supply chain is Scotland wide so is the services sector that delivers for oil and gas and in time, uh, more and more so, uh, for net zero. 
So I am more than happy to recognise the invaluable contribution of the highly skilled and internationally recognised workforce in the oil and gas sector and the part that it plays in Scotland's economy and what it does for us in the present time of supplying heat and electricity and uh, the economic contribution that it makes. But we have to recognise that the North Sea is a geo geographic, uh, geologically rather mature and declining base and geographically it is, is challenging to access compared with other fields. And we have to recognise that we, uh, th despite some of what has been absolutely uh, right to say about some of the oil and gas industry wanting not to transit into net zero, generally there is a worldwide uh, shifting, quite rightly, going on towards net zero. And there is huge opportunity for Scotland to realise. And that is why I absolutely welcome that the Scottish Government intends to bring forward a finalised energy strategy and just transition plan uh, later this summer, and one that takes an evidence-based and pragmatic approach and ensures that climate compatibility assessment and er energy security are properly reflected. And I would hope that at that juncture, out with an election period, we will have more time to talk and debate uh, these issues. So there's an absolute need to move to net zero and the just transition is absolutely the right way to go about that, as has been acknowledged. And that's more than anything else because unfortunately from history we know that if we don't project jobs and skills and we don't undertake a a change in a way that is sensitive to communities, then it causes very significant damage. And I do think there is an irony uh, from the Conservatives here in that the deindustrialisation that their government presided over is something that we are still, uh, unfortunately, having to deal with the repercussions of today in, in constituencies uh, across the country, including in mine. So, President Officer, as we move forward, towards net zero, we do so with respect and admiration for those who work in oil, of ga oil and gas, and they are part of how we move forward. So we move forward methodically but purposefully in I must ask you to conclude at that point, uh, Mr McPherson. Necessity, and we do so sensitively and strategically. Thank you. Thank you. We move to winding up speeches, and I call on Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I have to say, commend uh, Ben McPherson on a, a, on a thoughtful contribution that, to some extent, was a bit of an antidote um, to the, the contribution we had um, prior to that from, from Stephen Kerr. I mean, I, I, I acknowledge that this is a debate that's taking place in the election context. I, I recognise that Mr Kerr has more skin in the game in that respect than, uh, than the rest of us. But I, I think, slightly worryingly, the, the tone of this debate hasn't been largely different from the debate we had three months ago um, when uh, the election was but a glint in Rishi Sunak's uh, eye. And I, I think the point that was being made um, previously about the consensus, the general consensus we've had around issues uh, in the energy sector um, over many years now, does appear to be breaking down. And, 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 and that is a, a real concern. I think we've heard rather alarmist rhetoric in, in, in this debate about shutting down the sector from Tess White and from, from Stephen Kerr. But on the other hand, we've had Patrick Harvey suggesting that in the discussions around what happens ne next, the pace at which it happens, that somehow the industry, those with an interest in it, absolutely, they can be condemned perhaps for, or criticised for uh, actions in the past, but, but to exclude them from the process of what happens next and the pace at which it, it, it happens is not something we would contemplate or accept in any other respect. Very briefly, Mr Harvey. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful. Very briefly, would Mr MacArthur uh, accept the reality that the companies we're talking about are expanding their fossil fuel investments at the moment? They're not transitioning away. That's a matter of fact. I, I, Liam I, MacArthur. I don't, I don't accept that at all. There'll be th different things happening in different parts of the world. There is no doubt that oil and gas was going to remain a part of our energy mix for, for some time. But the, I, I think the notion that you can exclude those that have an interest in what happens next from those discussions is not something we would accept at all as in any other area. Now, despite 
the election context. I thought Daniel Johnson made a valiant effort in trying to draw together areas of, of common cause and, and, and whatnot, the contribution of the sector, certainly the inevitability of that transition, the investment that is going to be needed to, to deliver it, and that important point about confidence that many members ha have made. I, I would have to say that confidence across the energy sector hasn't been helped by some of the decisions by the UK government uh, over recent years. Um, I have to say that uh, Daniel Johnson's attempt to, to, to bring harmony certainly then fell, fell apart as he um, suggested the SNP were uh, less, um, I, I think, aggressive in terms of the windfall tax aspirations than the, than the Conservatives were. Uh, but it was indeed a valiant effort. Let me just conclude with a couple of the key points, I think, from, from the Liberal Democrat amendment today um, that we do need to see as part of this transition. One is the point that the UK CCC has been making for years about the need for both Scotland's governments uh, to work together on this, to, to develop detailed plans uh, for delivery uh, on their uh, ambitions. There is no point having ministers, whether they're based in Downing Street or based at St Andrew's House, uh, hunting out disagreement. And again, this has been an area where over the years, successive energy ministers in the Scottish Government and the UK Government have found uh, ways of working together, and we need to get back uh, to that. The other point, finally, is in relation to the transition. It is inevitable. I think that the, the disappointing thing about um, Douglas Lumsden's motion, but also his, his contribution, is he, he, he elided that. He, he avoided making any reference to that uh, whatsoever. That transition will look different in different parts of the country. My own Orkney constituency, for example, with a flot of oil terminals, has been integral to our island economy and community uh, for almost half a century. Um, we're going to see that transition. It may involve a, a transition to a green hydrogen terminal over, uh, over time. But that is, uh, I think, the embodiment of the transition uh, we need to see. What um, is certainly the case is that inaction and inadequate action uh, will come at a heavier price uh, than the action that we need to take. And on that basis, uh, I would urge Parliament to back the, motion in my name, the amendment in my name. Thank you. I call on Patrick Harvey. Presiding officer, I frequently reflected on the comparison between the debates that happened around a decade ago in relation to Long Gannett and those that are happening now in relation to the North Sea, because the same debate uh, is, is happening, uh, and I think the same lack of transparency with the, the workforce involved, just on a much, much bigger scale. Everybody knew that Scotland's last coal-fired power station was going to close, had to close, should close, would close. We all knew it. And yet the company that owned it, the local government, the Scottish government and the UK government kept on saying the same thing. We're fully committed to the long-term future of this plant. And that was a dishonest position then. It wasn't in the interests of the workforce in that plant, which was a doomed plant. It was going to close and we all knew it. What should have happened is that the last decade of its operational life should have been dedicated to investment in a, a decent economic future uh, for the period after the plant closed uh, for the local community. That didn't happen. That's what a planned transition would be about and that's the kind of honesty that's required in relation to the North Sea. So for the Conservatives to claim, as they do today, that they're the ones standing up for the workforce is entirely wrong. They are pretending that that industry has a long-term future when we all, all of us know that the oil and gas industry is not the future. As for the, the Liberal Democrat amendment, I, I, I recognise the valiant attempt uh, that Liam MacArthur is, is, is bringing to, to try to, to calm things down, and, and perhaps he, he's due credit for, for trying to do that, but I can't support an amendment that includes that mealy-mouthed phrase about phasing down fossil fuels. The very phrase that caused such utter dismay when fossil fuel lobbyists managed to get it into a COP report a few years ago. I, I don't expect uh, much better, I have to say, from the Conservatives uh, about their position, but I used to expect better from the SNP, I have to say. They had begun, finally, to end their fixation on supporting the fossil fuel industry. Uh, it appears that's no longer the case. The Cabinet Secretary says that in relation... Oh, sorry, I think it was the Minister who said in relation to uh, licensing, they'll take an evidence-based approach, but also says that will be on a case-by-case -case basis. The evidence that we have is that the entire world already has 
far more fossil fuel in existing reserves than we can afford to use. The UN says so. The International Energy Agency says so. The global climate experts say so. We have far more of the stuff than we can afford to use. There can be no justification for going looking for more. We've got a global glut of the stuff and we cannot use it. Uh, as for the, the Labour position, uh, I, I know that Daniel Johnson was very keen uh, and I, I enjoyed the fact that he was enjoying it to say that the SNP and Conservative positions were unclear and undefined uh, and, and uncertain and confused. I have to say that the Labour Party position in relation to GB Energy is no clearer. Uh, back in January, Sarah Boyack said that GB Energy uh, would be a publicly owned energy champion for clean energy. Uh, then in May, Anna Sawar said it would be a publicly owned energy generating company. Uh, just four days later, Keir Starmer said it would be an investment vehicle, not an energy company. But on the same day, Ed Miliband said it would be a company that generates electricity. Uh, and I'm sure there will be a position uh, that's set out today in the closing speeches. I'm sure they will have a position that they set out. But the point is there have been so many different positions that even the industry is unclear what it means. The one thing I'm clear about GB Energy is that it will lack the resources that it needs. Just a few months ago, Sarah Boyack uh, said uh, that the £28 billion commitment uh, was something they would be committed to. She said it would be crucial. Uh, last year, uh, I think Ed Miliband said, some people don't want Britain to borrow to invest in the green economy. They want Harvey. us to back down. Keir, Rachel and I will never let that happen. Britain needs this £28 billion a year. Now Keir, Rachel and Ed have backed down. That commitment Mr. is Harvey. gone. Uh, a, a commitment that Labour were describing Thank as you, essential just months ago. I call on Sarah Boyack. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I had been looking forward to this debate uh, since it was announced because I was intrigued to see which versions of each party we were going to have in the speeches. Would it be the SNP boast about climate action and only in March we're bringing amendments to motions arguing in favour of windfall taxes or would it be SNP the only party refusing to back a windfall tax on oil and gas giants who won't rule out new licences? For the Conservatives, uh, we also have the, um, the Tories of Jeremy Hunt's budget that extended the windfall tax access to 2029, or the Tories who want unlimited North Sea oil drilling in defiance of scientific reality and climate necessity. We got a bit of everything, some vague statements and some poorly mass desperate pleas from two struggling parties in an election cycle that they are not enjoying. So let me focus on the motion and the amendments. It won't come as any surprise that I cannot support Douglas Lumsden's motion. Uh, I absolutely value the work and contribution of our oil and gas workers, but supporting Douglas Lumsden's motion does not reflect the fact that the oil and gas deposits in the North Sea are declining. And as speakers have said right across the parties, we need a plan now, we need to invest now, and we need to be thinking about how we deliver a just transition. And in failing to acknowledge that fact, the Tories seem intent on doing to oil and gas workers what they did to the Scottish coal communities. We need investment in new opportunities. We need to work with the oil and gas sector as many of those companies are transitioning to renewables and they're investing in innovative technology which are reducing emissions in their operations now as they still produce oil and gas. And I thought the points that Ben McPherson made about jobs and skills were absolutely crucial. That's why we need the offshore part passport now so that workers can use their knowledge and experience over the coming decades as they work in the North Sea, both in oil and gas and in renewables, there and back. Yes. Minister. Uh, would say the board recognise that this is an industry-led scheme, the offshore skills passport, that government has given some money towards it, but it has been led by industry and they recently made an announcement on the progress on that. Sarah Boyack. But we need it to actually happen, and that's what we need the two governments to do to make sure it happens now, because there are workers that are already missing out on the opportunity of jobs. They either have to pay several thousands or they just have to give it up. And I think there's a real issue about uh, the content of the Cabinet Secretary's amendment, which is about the lack of actual action. Again, we've just heard that it would be nice if the business sector would deliver this, what's not happened yet. We've had far too many missed opportunities, and we 
we have been calling for the Energy and Just Transition Plan to be published for months, because we need the certainty. When I meet companies in the energy sector, they want clarity so they can invest now and with confidence. We have so many opportunities in Scotland, but the supply chains need to know where the investment is going to go. We know that we have potentially got new renewables construction in Leith. We know that there has been the Sumitomo project announced. There are things happening, but we need the joined-up approach. We need a plan for investment, because it's not just the words, the just transition, it's the implementation of it. And I'm so glad that, no, I need to move towards the end, last minute. Um, the GB Energy I mentioned in my opening speech, it's not a mystery. It is going to champion the transition. It is going to enable investment to be made. If you look right across Europe, there's lots of publicly owned energy companies. But in Scotland, what we need is a generating company that will actually get the investment going, that will support, Let us hear Ms. That will support investment by the public sector, it will support investment by the private sector, and it will bring both the UK and the Scottish just concluding. and our local authorities together. We need to work together because the climate emergency is a real issue. The challenge of fuel poverty, exacerbated by the Tory cost of living crisis, is a real issue. So we need action. Investment in green jobs now, working with the oil and gas sector, the renewable sector, to deliver the opportunities to give us Ms. a just Boyack. transition now and in the decades to come. Thank you, President Thank officer. you. And I call on Gillian Martin up to five minutes, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I want to begin by stating clearly that there is not going to be any route to net zero or energy security except in partnership with business, particularly businesses that are operating in Scotland, including Scotland's valued offshore energy industries. And Scotland's highly skilled existing oil and gas workforce are vital to delivering the transition to a renewable future, as, uh, as will investment from integrated energy companies. It is no longer a case of there's oil and gas companies over there and there's renewable companies over there. They are merged. They are working in partnership with one another, and then oil and gas companies are diversifying into renewables as well, as we have seen with the Scott Wind rounds. These people, these companies, are going to help us future proof our position as a major energy producing nature. And even if there weren't a climate emergency, even if it wasn't that existential threat, which we know it is, economically in the Scotland, in particularly the North East, the Highlands and Islands, the North and Shetland, we need to transition to a future to, uh, that future proofs energy jobs. We know, as so many people have said, that we have got a declining and a mature basin in the North Sea. The oil and gas companies recognise that, and that's why they're diversifying. We need to make sure that where levers remain reserved, that we need to call on the UK Government to act in order to support the transition in a way that, to be honest, they have not so far. I am going to move on to areas in which there actually is a lot of agreement. Daniel Johnson mentioned some of them about actually working, governments working together to make sure that Scotland gets the investment that it requires. I said to Sarah Boyack that we put £500 million just transition funding into the North East and Murray. Um, I'd like to see that matched by an incoming Labour government. We've got £500 million of strategic investment funding. I'd like to see that matched by an incoming Labour government as well. I'd like to see governments put their money where their mouth is, because we are at the epicentre in Scotland of the renewables revolution that is going to be powering and decarbonising the whole of the UK's energy supply. But if that doesn't happen, we are going to be continually reliant on the oil and gas and the burning thereof. Now, if we've got a mature basin, we are not going to be able to, to service that domestically. So we're going to be importing more. And this is where I agree wholeheartedly with Liam MacArthur, who has put the, the, the challenge squarely to the Conservatives, that if you are continually just denying the fact the oil and gas in the North Sea in the west of Shetland is a declining resource that is no longer going to be commercially viable to extract, then you are actually letting down the workers of the North East. We are the ones that are future-proofing. The people who have got their eye, and I'm not saying parties, I'm saying the parties that recognise this are the ones that are future-proofing Scotland's economy and also the jobs of future energy workers. And I think we'll have to make that point very, very clearly. Meanwhile, we need to help the oil and gas operators to um, invest in renewables, to work with other renewables companies, but also to reduce their production emissions. 
And we have done that with the Intog rounds, which is going to be supplying, um, have developments of uh, floating offshore wind, which allows production emissions to come down. And that would lead into the whole climate compatibility aspect of things. If oil and gas companies wanted to um, uh, apply for a licence for, for their new field, they would have to demonstrate, for example, that they were doing everything they could to bring down the emissions or the production associated with that. We want to see an evidence-based licensing regime for oil and gas. Um, we've consulted... Yes, I will. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. Could she clarify what she just said, that her uh, approach to evidence is going to be about production emissions only, not from the emissions associated with consumption? Was that correct? Minister. An example of a, of a condition that might be in a climate compatibility checkpoint. I did not say that that was the only condition in that climate compatibility checkpoint. But what I am saying is that Scotland is leading the way in the conversation around climate compatibility checkpoints, not just for the UK, but for oil producing companies, oil and gas producing companies across the world. Until we're in a position to until we're in a position that our systems in our country are no longer reliant on the burning of oil and gas like heating and transport. Mr is concluding. Look, I, I'm grateful for the Minister giving away and she's been very consensual, but would she recognise that the first previous person has said Rosebank would be tantamount to climate denial, so therefore this approach is quite significantly different to that previous statement and previous approach to licensing? I'm going to bring must it back conclude, to the Minister. workers, and, and, and I have to conclude. I'm going to, I'm going to bring it back to the, to the workers because that's really what we're talking about here. We're not talking about multinational companies. We're talking about Scotland's future economy. We need to recognise that even if there weren't a climate emergency, which there is, there is not a future for North Sea oil and gas beyond the next 50 years, and that's not I me must saying ask you to that. Conclude that is at the companies point, who are currently working in that area. Thank you, and I call on Liam Kerr to wind up the debate. Up to six minutes, please. President officer, it's been a very revealing debate. Firstly, it reveals a failure to appreciate demand. Oil and gas will be required for years, for decades to come, not only for power, although since it currently meets around 75% of the UK's currently, current energy needs, that is not going to change soon. But also, and this is what Liam MacArthur missed in an otherwise very interesting contribution, 2021 figures show around a quarter of the UK's oil and gas goes towards manufacturing everyday products. That's medicines, that's cosmetics, that's asphalt, it's materials for wind turbines and solar panels. And it was good to here, Tess White remind us that meeting demand here is vital for energy security, for a lower carbon footprint, for tens of thousands of Scottish jobs, of which 95% roughly are in the North East. So yes, we all want a transition, but curtailing supply before renewable energy capability can cope, as well as failing to answer the baseload question and cut demand, is illiterate. And it is a transition which, as Douglas Lumsden pointed out, will not happen without the support and investment of the oil and gas industry. As Ryan Crichton of the Aberdeen Chamber of Commerce put it, to achieve net zero, we need to unlock almost unfathomable amounts of capital. And that's in a context where investment doesn't often pay a return for years. Which leads me to the various amendments. Can I come back to you, please, Mr Johnson? Firstly, presiding officer, I have for some time thought that one of the few things Hamza Yusuf got right during his ill-fated time as First Minister was to eject the Green Party from government. So it was gratifying to read Patrick Harvey's amendment and listen to his unevidenced, dogmatic and, dare I say, extreme contributions and interventions today and be proved absolutely right. His ludicrous amendment bears absolutely no further consideration. But the Labour and SNP amendments display astonishing ambivalence and ignorance to investments, despite Daniel Johnson's rightly and constructively bringing it up. As a mature basin, the North Sea oil and gas sector is at greater risk of divestment than others as it becomes less economic. Yet the Labour Party's positioning reveals they don't understand that. Never forget 
that it was Keir Starmer last year who said he would end new exploration, which Audrey Nicholl rightly said would deter up to £30 billion of investment in Scotland. And as Sarwar on the leaders' debate said he wants oil and gas companies to invest, then in the same breath talks about not only hiking the energy profits levy, uh, a hike which has been reported could lead to 42,000 jobs lost and £26 billion of economic value wiped out, but also ripping away the investment allowances, specifically put in place to divert profits to renewables. Daniel Johnson. Daniel Johnson. Uh, would he accept that given that Shell made over £50 billion worth of profits over the last year, and Shell, uh, sorry, BP £30 billion, Shell uh, £50 billion, and, and m much of that excess profit used to share buyback, that is not a good use of money and that should be invested in renewables, which is what our proposition is. Liam Kerr. But Daniel Johnson would presumably accept that those profits are not specifically isolated to the UK, and he has to take a much more forensic analysis when he's putting statistics like that out. Because Stephen Kerr... Johnson. Let's stay with Labour on this, because Stephen Kerr brought up GB Energy. Let's ignore for a second that they can't tell us where it's going to be, or that it would apparently only employ 50 to 100 people. And let's focus on Keir Starmer going on GMS saying that it's an energy company, but it isn't an energy company and it won't produce energy until yesterday when he said it is an energy company and it produces energy. Sarah Boyack, I don't know, as you said, where, which party version turned up, but Sarah Boyack, which Keir Starmer can we expect to turn up on any given day? Through the but chair, let's be please. Clear. When it comes to uncertainty stifling investment, the Labour Party have got nothing on the SNP. Remember when, as Stephen Kerr pointed out, it was Scotland's oil and the 2013 SNP paper predicated on the average cash price not falling below $113 a barrel. Let me make the point, Mr Stewart. Halcyon days indeed, because in an abrupt vault fast, the SNP's energy strategy contains a presumption against oil and gas. Then this week, it turns out the First Minister is exploring his position on that presumption. Asked four times on Monday night whether he would back new licences, his answer was, at best, unclear. Shirley Ann Somerville was asked the same question on Radio 4. Four times yesterday, no clear answer. Meanwhile, Stephen Flynn was on Radio Scotland on the 29th of May, urging the SNP to change policy. And Kate Forbes was on... STV saying they've never said no to further licensing. No, I won't, thank you. President officer, the SNP are making it up as they go along yeah. and contradicting each other at every turn. That's not future-proofing, Gillian Martin. That's stifling investment. Who should investors believe, the First Minister or the two people manoeuvring to replace him? Presiding officer, as I said at the start, this debate has been revealing because what it has shown is the ignorance of the Greens, the incompetence of the SNP and the financial illiteracy of Labour. Go back through all the oil and gas debates of the last few years, all called by the Scottish Conservatives, and consistency and clarity runs through them. We back our oil and gas industry, we back our energy security, yeah. we back tens of thousands of jobs and we back a just transition, not with words but deeds like the £16 billion North Sea transition deal. So I urge Parliament, reject the contortions of Labour, yep. the confusions of the SNP and the delusions of the Greens and vote for the motion in Douglas Lumsden's name. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on re recognising the contribution of Scotland's oil and gas industry. It's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 13493 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I call on Jamie Hepburn to move the motion. Move, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Liz Smith to speak to and move Amendment 1413. My apologies. 13493.1. Up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. It is my understanding that prior to the selection by yourself of my topical question yesterday, that it was the intention of the Minister for Parliamentary Business to schedule a statement about the recent reports in the media that the Scottish Government would be handing back four hundred and fifty million of EU funds available for investment projects in Scotland. Yesterday, in her answers, the Deputy First Minister told the Chamber that these reports are untrue and that almost all of the allocated funds will be spent. She then added, and I quote, we will try to spend, endeavour to spend, as much of it as possible, which I have to say is hardly the most convincing line about the detail of the allocations of the money. 
The Deputy First Minister added that 60% of the available funds had been earmarked for local government investment projects, but there was no detail, nor did she elaborate on the Scottish Government's own acknowledgement that the initial available budget was reduced by €72 million, Euros, I will in a minute, because there had been lack of demand or a lack of ability to spend the money. Wonder, Kate Forbes. I wonder if the member does now accept, though, that this programme still has at least a year to run. And so if it had all been spent, in her words, by now, that would be somewhat dubious, considering there's still one year left of the programme. Yes. Liz Smith. I've actually spent quite a lot of this morning reading up on the EU rules on this, and I do understand what is being asked for here, but I have to remind the Deputy First Minister that the Scottish Government has handed back already €199 Euro, million. Euros. And what I'm asking for, Deputy First Minister, is clarity. And I know that that's what's, what the rest of the Chamber is asking for. We would like clarity, because if you are, are saying that, that the £450 million is inaccurate, you must have some idea of what the actual figure is. And what I think this Parliament ought to know yeah. is what that money is and yeah. what has been earmarked for it. So, Presiding Officer, that's why I'm asking for a statement so that we can provide uh, further information and also scrutinise what the Scottish Government is actually saying on this. Because I come back to the point I made yesterday, if there is money that has been available, then we ought to know about it. And we ought to be able to tell local government, all the people who have been involved in enterprise, budgets and all these things, exactly where that money is. Because if we are not doing that, we are not being transparent and we are not ensuring that this Parliament is looking after the public. Thank you. And I call on Daniel Johnston to speak on the motion. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise in support of the appeal to change the business motion for, for uh, the following key reasons. First of all, the quantum of the sums involved. This is hundreds of millions of pounds worth of funding. And while the absolute figure may be disputed, this is potentially up to uh, uh, around 1% of the Scottish uh, Government's budget. What we do know is that some of the, many of these figures are a, a, a matter of published fact, uh, published by the EU itself. What we also know is that many of these funding methods are technical, dependent on match funding and other things. Uh, and finally, there's the matter of timing. And while there is uh, the claim that there is a year to go, there are also uh, uh, at the very least speculation that some of these deadlines are looming as soon as the end of June. So for these matters in terms of the quantum, comparison with published fact, the technical nature of these and the timelines. I believe uh, that, that simply a, a, a topical question that starts this week is inadequate to answer these questions and Parliament needs a statement so we can interrogate these facts because of the significant concern and the significant sums of money involved. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call on the Minister to respond on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau. Up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. It is uh, the case that uh, I received a request from the Conservative Party to schedule a ministerial statement on EU structural funds for this week. I, I wrote to business managers to explain that I had uh, intended to schedule this statement as requested, but given a topical question on EU structural funds had been selected and was uh, indeed asked yesterday, I felt it was no longer uh, required. In writing that letter, uh, to all business managers, I received no response from the Conservative Party business manager to my note, uh, nor did he particularly push for the statement when it was discussed at Bureau, otherwise we could have discussed the request in more detail. Briefly. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful for the Minister to take an intervention on that point. And isn't it the case that following the topical questions, it would appear from the contributions from either side of this chamber that further questions have arisen, that the appropriateness now of a statement is the right vehicle for this chamber to hold to account the Scottish Government? Minister. Well, of course, there are many mechanisms, many means by which members can do that just now. And I noticed Mr Johnson said that the topical question wasn't enough. I'm unaware of Mr Johnson, he can stand on his feet and tell me now, whether he pressed his button to seek to ask a question at topical questions on Through Tuesday. the chair, always. 
Daniel Johnson. Do, does uh, the Minister accept that sometimes the facts change, and when the facts change, then so should your position? And, and therefore, does he not accept that with the further questions there arisen, more questions should be permitted in the, in the chamber? Minister. So I think the fact is Mr Johnson didn't bother pressing his button yesterday no. to seek to ask a question. No. President officer, in the short period in which I have held uh, the particular office that I do now, I believe uh, I have uh, sought to be reasonable in responding to requests from uh, other parties. Earlier today, we had a statement on low emission zones following a request by the Conservative Party. Last week, we had a statement on industrial action in Scotland's colleges following a request by the Labour Party. I brought the timetabling of those to the Bureau and made sure those requests could be accommodated. Of course, I give way to Mr Burnett. Sandra thank Burnett. the Minister for taking the, taking the intervention. And I would just like to say for the record, uh, since the minutes of the Bureau do not go into the detail uh, that allow, this, uh, allow what was said to be reflected, uh, but I did say that we would reserve our position on the business motion as we're doing today uh, if the answers to the topical question were not sufficient. And I did make that clear yeah. at the Bureau, and I would like that reflected for the record now. Minister. And of course, I'm making the point and making it again, I am a reasonable person, and if we'd had a fuller discussion, then we could have considered scheduling uh, this debate. Par party business managers can bring these matters uh, to Bureau, and members surely have to entrust uh, these responsibilities to those business managers. Of course, I recognise and respect the right of members to do so, but it is my hope that we will not see continual attempts to amend business presented by the Bureau for Parliament's agreement. These matters have been discussed and agreed by Bureau. I will at all times operate on the basis of seeking to facilitate fair and reasonable requests, just as I had been ready to with the one made in respect of EU search funds. There has been, as I mentioned, a topical question on this matter taken already this week, and indeed it was Liz Smith who asked that question. And in relation to that, of course, the Deputy First Minister gave a full answer to Ms Smith on uh, that uh, particular issue, and so full uh, was that answer, Ms Smith was able to regale us with the details uh, today. And it was very clear that the suggestion that the government will not allocate uh, £450 million pounds of available EU funding for investment projects in Scotland is incorrect, as the programme is not yet complete. And indeed, partners have always had access to the funding they requested. Final expenditure figures for uh, this funding will be published and reported to Parliament as soon as as they are finalised. I can see no reason for scheduling a further statement, which will only reconfirm the position that has now been outlined twice to the Chamber in the last two days. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 13493.1 in the name of Liz Smith, which seeks to amend Motion 13493 in the name of Jamie Hepburn, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.